Coming up in the morning edition, national exams resume today for students across this country. There was approximately 6,500 candidates registered, and we know that there are some students who would have gone off to university. Also, hear concerns facing pediatricians during the pandemic. Children do not need to be home indefinitely because it's not good for their mental, physical, or social well-being. And meeting the growing food demand nationwide. We have about 60 volunteers strong. And they, they are here and they work non-stop. We have all those stories for you and more in the morning edition. Come right back. Andres is the number one born fishing destination on our planet. Sports fishermen visit our flats every year to participate in one of the most fulfilling outdoor activities known to man, fly fishing. And guess what? It's 100% sustainable. Without areas like the west side of Andres, sustaining this industry would be absolutely impossible. So let's take care of nature, and nature will take care of us. ZNS is everywhere you are when you download the new ZNS app. Watch our live channel to keep up with what's going on in the nation. News updates, we've got you covered. Tune into our radio stations with just a swipe. On the road, on the go, we're here with you. Available for download on the App Store and the Google Play Store. As an artist, I travel all over the world and I find inspiration all around me. In the people, and especially the environment. I love the Bahamas with all its natural beauty. From Abaco in the north to Inagua in the south and all the wonderful and colorful islands in between. And we must all do our part to keep the Bahamas healthy and clean, now and for the future generations. That's why I want you to find a little time to do your part. I'm doing my part because I care. Do you? Back to the examination rooms for thousands of students. Good morning, everyone. I'm LaDawn Davis, and this is the Morning Edition. Thank you so much for tuning in. Students will face another attempt at writing the Bahamas General Certificate of Secondary Education, the BGCSE, and Bahamas Junior Certificate. But as it stands now, education officials say everything is in place to mitigate against COVID-19 concerns. Here's Jimonita Swain. Practical and theory segments for national examinations are slated to commence today, September 14th, for senior students and junior students across the country. Thousands were set to write the exams, even though many would have already entered a tertiary institution. Under Secretary in the Ministry of Education with Administration for National Examinations, Sarethia Clark says practicals for the BJC exams will commence this week as well. We expect some changes in that number. Initially, there was approximately 6,500 candidates registered, and we know that there are some students who would have gone off to university. The students who are at the University of the Bahamas, we have been able to liaise with the University of the Bahamas, and President Smith has confirmed that the lecturers are aware of students sitting the BGCSE exams, and these students are not to be penalized for the days when they are not a part of their virtual sessions. Students will sit exams at the schools where they initially registered. Ninth grade students in the public schools would be getting ready to move into a new school come the 5th of October when school reopens because they would have completed their tenure at the junior high school. And so they would be going on to a senior high school. With so many disruptions and adjustments due to the coronavirus pandemic in the year, students who feel ill-prepared for the national exams have this option. If they don't feel comfortable sitting the exam, that they can ask to have it deferred to next year. And if they're asking for a refund, 
they would have to go to the school and complete an application that has to be processed. Clark says school campuses are ready for students and equipped with necessary safety protocols. The students know that when they get to the schools, they have to sanitize as well. So we have persons, we, the Ministry of Education has gone to the extent of hiring additional persons who we're referring to as runners, and these persons will be able to assist in ensuring that safety protocols are being followed. Persons are going to the rooms where they're supposed to be, making sure that examiners are in the rooms and so on to help us to manage the exams. Officials say considerations will be given to the challenges students have had to endure and each student will have the chance to share what they have learned and the ministry will not seek to disadvantage any candidate. Jiminy Swain, ZNS Network News. The Ministry of Education, meantime, is giving the assurance that schools being used for national examinations are safe. This in response to Bahamas Union of Teachers President Belinda Wilson's claims that, that, that they are unsafe conditions in our public schools. However, the ministry contends such assertions were made to create panic among parents, teachers and students to derail national examinations. The ministry says those premises, premises rather, where cases were reported have been vacated and thoroughly cleaned by the environmental monitoring and risk assessment team. It was also pointed out that PPEs, cleaners and sanitizers are in place at government schools and staff have undergone the required COVID-19 cleaning training by the Department of Environmental Health Services. Well, this academic year has been far from normal and for a student sitting national examinations, family therapist Dr. Edrika Richardson shares this advice. Do your best. Just try to hang in there because these are not the most ideal situations right now. And for some of you who have even moved on to tertiary education at this point, um, if you can go back and take those exams, if they may hinder any process of you getting off or abroad for continued studies, but you have to pace yourself. At this point, parents and those students are going to have to consider whether or not those are the best circumstances for the individuals to take the exams right now. One of the things we cannot negate is the fact that there are a lot of changing factors and the mental health of everybody right now is of the utmost importance. As the national exams get underway and thousands of students prepare to return to school, we decided to sought the advice and hear the concerns of pediatricians. Our interview comes amidst the current pandemic, which has interrupted the normal medical and learning process in this country. Here's Charles Fisher. Many parents and guardians have mixed reactions. Should I enroll my little one in face-to-face -face or virtual learning? Dr. Rochelle Williams of the Pediatrics Association had this to say. I don't think they should be worried. I think we, we're living in a very challenging environment. As you know, WHO has already said that, you know, we have a pandemic, it's ongoing, and it's not going to get any better anytime soon, and we're going to have to live with this. With that said, adjustments will have to be made. Children are a part of our heritage, and going to school is a part of their socialization. We know that we have a pandemic. We are not unaware of that. But the children have been home since March. Denmark has opened up their schools earlier this year. They've not seen an increase. Yes, I know there's increases in the United States, but remember, we are not the United States. We, as a country, have done a really good job in trying to control this. We are not in control. We realize that. But we're opening up. We have to make some adjustments. The children do not need to be home indefinitely because it's not good for their mental, physical, or social well-being. Anxiety, depression, these are things that little children will experience. And you must not say that, okay, well, you know, we need to keep them at home. They want to go to school. This is where they socialize. Yes, they want to socialize. That may be a concern, but remember this, there are some important factors working in their favor. They're not the super spreaders. They are the lowest denominator in this pandemic. Less than 5% of kids worldwide have had positive COVID um, test results. And remember, positive is twofold. One is positive and you're asymptomatic. You're not spreading. Positive and you're symptomatic. Yes, you're spreading. Kids, their immune system, thank goodness, is actually very, it's so unique that they're doing way better than adults. Their symptoms are not as severe. Yes, we know that we have problems with those symptoms. 
But the reality is, is that with the protocols in place, hand washing, sanitizing, making sure you don't come to school with a fever, parents still have to be vigilant. Once you're vigilant, and you're vigilant at home, because it's a twofold thing, your child will be fine. But if we do not follow the protocols, we're going to have problems. And it is up to the institution to make sure measures are in place. The social distancing, kids not sharing things, kids making sure they wash their hands. Little kids are actually very resilient about listening to you once you speak to them appropriately. You show them how to use the mask in this practice and my own. We've been showing the kids how to use the mask, how to hand sanitize, how to wash their hands properly. You know, all of these things, and they get it. All they're saying is they want to see their friends, they want to go to school. Everything is a risk in this life. But we're opening the supermarkets, we're opening the drug stores, we're opening all the, we're inviting tourists in. Our children are our future if we do not make an effort to try and address the fact that they need a, a better environment than what they've got now. We're gonna lose them. This is something Dr. Williams stressed we will have to live with. No matter what people say, there is no vaccine around the corner and vaccines need to be they need to be effective not just you know there this vaccine is still a work in progress so all we can do is preventative prevention is what we've got and parents don't need to be afraid they need to look at this from a hygiene standpoint all we're asking is for the general community to up their game with their hygiene parents have to do this they have to set the standard grandparents have to do this they have to set the standard they can't just keep the kids home. It's not good for our community. We already have a lot of social ills going on. Child abuse, um, you know, kids, kids acting out, joining gangs and stuff. This starts in the home. So you're going to keep the kids at home for another six months? I'm not saying it's going to get better right over, you know, the, the numbers are going to get better. It's a work in progress. We have to work together. We have to continue with all the messes that are put in place. In our continued conversation with Dr. Williams, she will speak about other kids' diseases we should look out for, and with the flu season upon us, what does this mean? For the Morning Edition, I'm Charles Fisher. Meantime, the COVID-19 numbers are still showing a significant jump in new cases here in New Providence. The latest figures revealed saw 54 additional positive patients, with 45 of them here in New Providence. New cases are also showing up in Abaco, Eleuthera, and Exuma. The overall COVID numbers are at 2,928. Now we will hear more from the Ministry of Health on those growing numbers and more efforts to curb the current pandemic during a press conference today at 5 o'clock. The ministry's press conference will be carried live here on the ZNS television and radio network. And still to come, more on the plight facing vendors at Awaki. That story and more when the morning edition returns. navigate through this new way of learning. You should prepare for your online classes just as if you were attending a face-to-face -face class on your school's campus. So be on time. Wake up early and log on to the virtual platform at least five minutes before the start of your class. Set up a space that is dedicated to being used as a daily learning environment. This would help you to establish a routine. Your space can be at your dining room table, a library, or your church hall. It just needs to be a quiet place that is conducive to studying. Be prepared. Make sure your computer or tablet is fully charged and your camera is on. Use headphones, especially if you are in a shared space. Dress in appropriate clothing. Sit up straight. Remember, you will be in camera view. Mute your audio when your teacher is speaking. Be focused, be attentive, and actively participate. Before speaking, raise your hands, then type your questions in the chat box. Avoid distractions, and remember to always be respectful, kind, and considerate. Your teachers will be there to assist, and you will make online friends and create virtual study groups. Online study may be new, but with dedication and persistence, you will achieve your goals.
It is normal to feel overwhelmed, lonely, scared, or sad during a crisis. Coping can be difficult when your daily schedule is interrupted. Drinking may feel good, but is not the best way to cope with stress. It can worsen your mental and physical health and impact your family. So how can you cope? Keep physically active, like taking a walk or dancing. Cook and eat nutritious food, including fruits and vegetables. Engage in indoor activities like playing games and staying connected with family and friends. Meditate, encourage yourself, or enjoy music. Still feeling overwhelmed? We are here to listen. This message is brought to you by these partners. Andres is the number one born fishing destination on our planet. Sports fishermen visit our flats every year to participate in one of the most fulfilling outdoor activities known to man, fly fishing. And guess what? It's 100% sustainable. Without areas like the west side of Andres, sustaining this industry would be absolutely impossible. So let's take care of nature, and nature will take care of us. officials clearing up any solvency concerns with the National Insurance Board's fund in light of the millions spent to assist those impacted by the coronavirus. NIB officials say about $93 million were paid out, but Acting Financial Secretary Marlon Johnson maintains the fund is sound. We can say categorically that the NIB remains solvent. The, NIB, the monies that, put on, that are contributed to NIB go into a, a reserve that is invested. So the NIB is properly capitalized. It produces its reports annually to speak to its capitalization. And this is what has allowed it to be able to weather a shock like this, whereby in, in a given year they would only deal with a few thousand applications uh, for unemployment assistance, and they ended up with over 30,000 applications within a small uh, period of time and have been able to meet the commitments. So no, NIB remains solvent and there, there are really no concerns there. And they, they monitor their activities and their expenditure daily to ensure that that remains. With the economy opening up, the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, the Honorable Peter Turnquist, is optimistic that more people will head back to work. We anticipate that the economy is going to start to open uh, at the end of this month going, I think the, the tourism minister indicated that tourism will open on the 15th uh, of, of October. So by then we anticipate that with the loosening up of the economy that is already underway, that that will relieve some of the pressure. Uh, and as the uh, tourism sector kicks in, that more people will go back to work, which will allow us to uh, utilize the remaining resources that we've budgeted uh, for this program to go a little bit further for those persons who may take a little bit longer uh, to get back into the swing uh, of things. So the, the, the short answer to your question is we will continue to do uh, what we can to support uh, Bahamians as best we can through the various assistance programs that are available, either through direct income support, through social services, through the feeding network, um, or any of the other programs that are available to the government, uh, we will certainly in ensure that they are funded and that, that we can do the best we can with the resources that we have. Now we've got more to share with you on those donations made for the restoration of Abaco and Grand Bahama following Hurricane Dorian. Managing Director of the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, K. Forbes Smith, is clearing the air on the pledge conference. Smith noted that there were 49 pledges on the day of the conference back in January, totaling $1.77 billion. The $1.65 um, that was pledged by P3 which was a private equity firm, and really what they were doing, they were projects. And I want to say also that a lot of the other um, pledges were pledges that we probably couldn't even take advantage of. Because sometimes, and I don't want to call out the, the donor's name because I think it would be inappropriate, but we would have had a pledge from someone, for example, this is an example, who may have said, uh, we will give you $500,000 
towards um, project management. But what it meant was they wanted us to hire them, for example, to, 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 to be the project managers for a specific project. Or you had someone who said, I'm going to give you $2 million uh, towards a solar grid panel, for example, but they wanted you to engage in a project that would probably cost us about six or seven or even $10 million to even do a particular project. So, so I'm hoping, I hope you're kind of understanding that a lot of people who pledged that day, they pledged to give you something, but you then had to get involved. Forbes Smith said while she is being cautious not to offend donors, it was important for Bahamians to understand the current status of those pledges. And then when the minister spoke about this $300,000 in cash that was pledged, that was so. But what happened is we received 109000 of that cash that day. The other 200000 or so, we have not gotten that cash yet. And that was pledged by a local donor in the Bahamas. And I think a lot of what's going on with some of the monies not coming in uh, has a lot to do with the COVID-19 and where companies find themselves. Some people we can't reach. Some, some of them were government pledges. So there were about seven governments that pledged something. So what we did is those pledges are being actively pursued through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I think the U.S. government, for example, had pledged this $2.1 million towards some security, national security. I don't know specifically what it is yet, but because we, we felt that the best thing to do with the government pledges were for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, country to country, diplomatic note to diplomatic note, would go ahead and pursue those pledges. A multi-million dollar investment by the government and a partnership with several charitable organizations is making food more accessible for many families struggling in these difficult times. Officials with the National Food Task Force now say their output has increased significantly in just a few months. Here's Cleopatra Murphy. With more and more Bahamians struggling to meet ends meet and just to put a hot meal on the table, the Bahamas Feeding Network has stepped up its efforts to ensure Bahamians do not go hungry. At the organization's warehouse, its team of volunteers are busy six days a week arranging food parcels for families in need. Executive Director Philip Smith says from March to the end of May, the Feeding Network distributed over $500,000 in food parcels. That figure has tripled since June when the organization became a part of the Food Security Task Force. Smith says from June to the end of August, $2 million in food parcels have been distributed amidst increasing demands for food. This week, the numbers have just skyrocketed. We were around 4,200. We are now up to 70, 7,200 in Nassau, 7,200 households in Nassau, 1,600 households in the Family Island. And... Um, we're looking at, um, that's a total of about 35,300 individuals. To respond to the need for expanded social assistance, a direct result of the loss of jobs due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Smith says government allotted $16.2 million to the Food Security Task Force, and that has engaged between 150 to 200 NGOs, churches, and organizations. In New Providence, he says the Bahamas Feeding Network supplies 18 organizations in its zone and another eight in family islands in the southern Bahamas. San Salvador is one of those islands and the latest to receive a shipment of food. He says they take place every two weeks. In Nassau, we were doing every week. We are now distributing in Nassau every two weeks as well. Uh, Mayaguana, Crooked Island, Long Island, Inagua, San Salvador, Acklands, Rum Key, and Long Key. Organizations collect food parcels from the feeding network on Wednesday and Fridays to distribute into the community. Smith says the feeding initiative is a crucial lifeline for many families, adding that along with government's contribution, NGOs have invested another $2 million. Um, we have an excellent group of uh, organizations that are managing the um, initiative. We have Susan Larson, who is the chairman. She is doing a fantastic job. So it's going extremely well, and so she would a, a wonderful thing can happen when you have public and private come together and you have the right groups that you're working with. 
Smith says for the Bahamas Feeding Network, its team of volunteers have been invaluable. We have about 60 volunteers strong, and they, they are here and they work nonstop. So um, six days a week we are packaging, like you see here, um, and they come, so we divide them up just to have proper spacing. With an increasing number of Bahamians falling on hard times, Smith appealed to those who can assist to log on to www.bahamasfeedingnetwork.org and make a donation. Cleopatra Murphy, Sadness Network News. Arawak key vendors say they are experiencing a drought at the popular cultural hub. This as business establishments at the fish fry continue to attract few customers. The colorful Isle of Small Businesses is popular for its down-home cuisine and picturesque outdoor seating. However, COVID-19 restrictions still prohibit the latter. Our news team spoke with some fish fry vendors who say they have turned to extraordinary circumstances. Well, you know, I just push my social media as much as I can. And um, once, once or twice, I probably jump in my vehicle and I probably do my own delivery. But we have to do what we have to do until it gets better. The most customers we probably had, uh, had a day, probably is about, say about 35, 40, 50 the max. And it's good. Like what we did now, we now on with Quaven app. So now that working a little bit for us in terms of people ordering and, and having it being delivered. But other than that, it's been like this and people is not coming up with the fish fry anymore. I don't know why. Some vendors are operating at less than 50% of their capacity. Still, many are hoping for a silver lining. Oh, it's been very, very slow, very slow. So like I tell you, eventually as, you know, time picks up and people um, are able to get over their financial burdens, I believe it's gonna, it's gonna come back. It's gonna come back. I'm hoping so, and I have that gut feeling. Because, you know, out here, it's always booming, always. So I think, you know, as things get on and the, and the bond is lift and this COVID is sort of level off, I think people are going to come back and they're going to, things going to be good again. Stay close. We've got more right after this. You're watching The Morning Edition. It is important to take precautions to reduce your risk of getting infected with COVID-19, even when you go to the grocery store. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others while you wait in line to enter the store. One person per household needs to go. Use wipes to disinfect the cart or basket handle that you select. Avoid touching your face, unnecessary items, and surfaces. Try to touch only what you are buying. So carry a grocery list to help you move along quickly. Do not forget to wear a cloth mask while you do your shopping and carry hand sanitizer with you. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others as you shop. And at the cash register. As little time as possible in the store and get enough groceries to last you for a while. Once your groceries are packed and loaded, use hand sanitizer and rub your hands together until they are completely dry. When you come home from the grocery store, take off your shoes at the door and put all of your grocery bags in one area. Disinfect your grocery bags. Rinse produce and wipe down cans and packages with soap and water before you put them away. Wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds when you are done. Wash your clothes and your reusable grocery bags. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. a part of all our lives. ZNS TV is where we go for information.
entertainment and enjoyment. ZNS is there with something for everyone. Kids, lunch is ready. ZNS TV, a part of our lives for 40 years. It is normal to feel overwhelmed, lonely, scared, or sad during a crisis. Coping can be difficult when your daily schedule is interrupted. Drinking may feel good, but is not the best way to cope with stress. It can worsen your mental and physical health and impact your family. So how can you cope? Keep physically active, like taking a walk or dancing. Cook and eat nutritious food, including fruits and vegetables. Engage in indoor activities, like playing games and staying connected with family and friends. Meditate, encourage yourself, or enjoy music. Still feeling overwhelmed? We are here to listen. This message is brought to you by these partners. Welcome back. Well, Lloyd Allen and the traffic team are out and about on our streets this morning as we begin our Monday commute. Stop you. I'm taking you. May not, I'm not interested in you. Well, good morning, Ladon. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning, we're giving you a first look at traffic. This one coming in there, the intersection of East Street and Robinson Road. Now, just before we get started, we do want to advise members of the public, rather uh, those public bus drivers uh, who we've observed, as well as members of the Royal Bahamas Police Force, that they tend to uh, do pickups right here in, in front of Miracle Tours. They are being advised that that uh, stop should not happen. Uh, that's considered obstructing traffic, and that comes with a charge of about $150. And so you do want to be advised, uh, public bus drivers, that you should not be pulling over here on Robinson Road, that you should find the nearest bus stop. This morning, we're also joined by Corporal Patrick Kemp from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, who's giving you an initial look at weekend traffic. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Island, and good morning, Bahamas. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, we are at the intersection of uh, East Street and Robinson Road. We do experience a, a number of infractions that takes place in this thoroughfare, mainly failing to keep left. And as you pointed out earlier, with the bus drivers in particular that are stopping in the area of Miracle Tours causing obstruction. And a lot of them, I don't know if they pay attention. I don't know if a lot of them can read. They should be able to. But they stop right in the front of the sign that clearly says this is not an official bus stop. So I'm wanting the drivers out there to please pay attention to that and to avoid being ticketed. Also over the weekend, we have had some nine accidents. Two of those that were a uh, traffic accident that occurred with injuries. Uh, one of those was serious. And we're going to continue to encourage the, the drivers out there to pay attention. Plan your road and take your time wherever you're traveling through the streets of New Providence and the Bahamas. There's no need and there's no reason for you to exceed the speed limit to go anywhere. Uh, in this country that's going to cause you to be ticketed or risk getting yourself an injury or risk injuring somebody else. Well, as you can see as well from our drone shots, uh, traffic definitely is flowing in this area, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, nine traffic accidents over the weekend. That's nine too many. Uh, however, accidents do happen to happen, uh, you know, and sometimes it's beyond our control. One thing that is within our control, though, is wearing the seatbelt. Uh, you know, I did some research over the weekend that talked about some of the safety tips or um, uh, 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 measures that could happen as a result of wearing the seatbelt. They obviously protect lives. Uh, there's been about an 87% increase of the use of seatbelts since 1987 to 2017. Any other um, uh, things you've noticed uh, when it comes to the proper use of seatbelt and, and how it benefits a driver? Well, it, it obviously it benefits the driver in many ways. And one of those ways, obviously, is to prevent them from being ejected from the vehicle. And, and I must stress, while we're on the topic, we still have poisons on uh, island who are still traveling, choosing out the street, 
with their children in the front seat, not properly seat belting and in their in their proper in their proper seat. And I'm telling you, if we stop you, me and my officers, we're not going to be interested in your dry cry. We're not going to be interested in uh, whatever excuse you can give because there's no excuse you can give for your little one driving in the front seat unsecured. You will be you will be dealt with accordingly, and you will find yourself before the courts. Now, I watched a demo video as well. It said that if you're driving, uh, most of, like in an area like this, the speed limit, uh, it's about 25 miles per hour. And uh, uh, it demonstrated that at 25 miles per hour, in fact, uh, if you should uh, have a collision, that's the equivalent of falling from a two-story building, which is still relative damage. And so, of course, if you do have a, a child in your vehicle, uh, that child can be ejected from the vehicle, uh, injured otherwise, or other passengers injured. Um, specifically, um, also for teen drivers uh, who tend to, unfortunately, drink and drive, uh, it's, you know, popular within that age group. Um, wearing seatbelt is definitely saves lives. Oh, it does. It does. And and on top of that, if, if I may, I, I have to touch on this. It's, it's, a, it's a concern of ours. Uh, persons are still utilizing their cell phones whilst they're traveling through the streets. And, and, and based on what you said about driving at, at 25 miles per hour, Lord, if you're traveling at speeds of about 30 miles per hour, per feet, you're clearing at least 25 to 30 feet per second. And if you're not paying attention while you're traveling behind persons, especially if, you have, if you're using your cell phone, and you're clearing about 25 to 30 feet per second, and you are about 10 to 15 feet behind somebody, at what point are you going to avoid colliding with that vehicle if you have to apply sudden brakes? All right? You don't have enough time. And based on the calculation, the time and the distance doesn't allow you the privilege of avoiding that vehicle. So I'm going to ask persons out there to please be mindful of the way you're, you're, you're driving, pay attention, uh, stop the use of these cell phones, make sure you're properly seat belted and your passengers. All right, good stuff. So, of course, appreciate that update coming in from uh, Corporal Camp this morning as you prepare to make your rounds on this Monday morning. Very busy here in the Robinson Road area. For the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Over in Abaco, a team of officers led by Assistant Commissioner Police Ashton Greenslade launched Operation Curfew. This took them to several businesses on the island where they met a large number of people. The businesses were shut down and the patrons warned of prosecution. An hour later, after 11 p.m., officers in the Marsh Harbor and Dundastown community arrested 29 people found in breach of the COVID-19 emergency order. They are all expected to be arraigned sometime this week. Meantime, some good news to report this morning on Abaco traffic accident survivor Brittany Edgecombe. This, this as Edgecombe has been flown out of doctor's hospital here in the capital. Family members say she is now in the care of medical professionals at a health facility in Boca to Columbia. Edgecombe, a team of doctors and her father made the long trip last night. She is expected to undergo that life-changing surgery she needs within the next few days. However, her family still needs some additional funds to assist with the long road to recovery. Well, Charles Fisher joins us live again this Monday morning. Tell us what's happening with your series. Good morning Police. once again, LaDawn. This morning we're going into the lady who's responsible for the Human Resources Department. She's been on the force quite some time as well. And as you will hear in this report from her, she's very, very happy to be still on the force and helping persons behind the scene. Chief Superintendent Petrona Bethel has been on the force some 36 years. When she first enlisted, there were not much females joining. So why did she decide to serve her country? During my interview to join the Robert Bahamas Police Force, I was asked that same question. Why do you want to be a police officer? And I said, to serve my country. And that's where, my, where I'm at today, rendering service, not only to the country, but to the police officers on the whole. I have been posted at Central Division, where I performed general police duties and um, um, foot patrol, um, police control room, formerly called Radio and Transport Division, where I was a switchboard and family island operator police pay office, police personnel now known as human resource section, the police canteen. I also serve 
as the station sergeants at both Eastern and Southern Division, and now I'm at headquarters as the director of Human Resource Action. From being a person on the streets to now overseeing the welfare of officers, she has seen lots of transition. From writing reports to typing reports, now we are in, computer, in the computer age. And even in terms of elevation, you know, we have training both locally and internationally officers are afforded those opportunities. We are responsible for an officer's journey through the organization. Okay, that's uh, promotions, reclassifications for civilians, um, training and development, postings, transfers, commendations, um, disciplinary record, if applicable, our record of vacation leave, sickness, and eventually the mission of offer. And the rewards have also come. I have been awarded two commendation awards, one for long service and good conduct, and one for meritorious service, which are given at Government House by the Governor General. And I am a part of the protocol team of the organization serving at funerals of, of our fallen colleagues, the police annual balls, and even the commissioner's handing over ceremonies, just to name a few. I've also participated in a number of independence parades, even as an inspector, where I led. Yes, she do have a life outside of the force. My husband and I, we've, we've been married for, for 33 years. Um, we have two biological children. I have four stepchildren, four beautiful grandchildren. And um, I have my family support including my mom and my siblings, they're there, and they're there to always encourage me in whatever I in, um, adventure that I may take, they're, they're my number one support. And outside of the family realm, I have my church realm. I've been a part of First Baptist Church for more than 30 years, where I serve as a head usher. What drives me that God promised me in his word that once I acknowledge him, he will direct my path. Well, LaDawn, as you can see with most of the ladies I've been interviewing, they are married to police officers, mm. and also they have one thing in common. They put their life in the trust of the Lord. And yesterday I was riding on the street at about 10 o'clock, and I saw somebody look like you. I said, look at LaDawn going inside church. <laughs> really? But it wasn't you, so I had to put on my glasses to make sure it wasn't you. And I, I, I see that wasn't you yesterday, making no, sure. No, I didn't go to church yesterday. Okay, right. no, I, didn't I thought go you to told me you were going. I, no, I, I'm still afraid of, of you know, going to church in the, in the midst of COVID-19, so I, I opted not to go. I saw someone in this beautiful floral dress and I know I say that, that can't be the dog. Probably my twin, who, who knows? Oh, okay. <laughs> so what, so what, do you, what can you tell now us about tomorrow? tomorrow we're going to deal, we're going to go deeper inside of the HR office of the mm -hmm. Royal Bahamas Police Force. They deal with everything from police officers' death, dealing with their family, and mm -hmm. right now with COVID going on, it's interesting things have up to change, it's up to adjust. So we're going to deal with that coming up tomorrow in the special report once again with Chief Superintendent Bichuna Bethel. We'll be looking forward to that tomorrow. Thank you so much, Fisher. Stay close, we've got more right after this. You're watching The Morning Edition. Hey. Successfully navigate through this new way of learning. You should prepare for your online classes just as if you were attending a face-to-face -face class on your school's campus. So be on time. Wake up early and log on to the virtual platform at least five minutes before the start of your class. Set up a space that is dedicated to being used as a daily learning environment. This would help you to establish a routine. Your space can be at your dining room table, a library, or your church hall. It just needs to be a quiet place that is conducive to studying. Be prepared, make sure your computer or tablet is fully charged and your camera is on. Use headphones, especially if you are in a shared space. Dress in appropriate clothing, sit up straight. Remember, you will be in camera view. Mute your audio when your teacher is speaking. Be focused, be attentive and actively participate. Before speaking, raise your hands, then type your questions in the chat box. 
avoid distractions, and remember to always be respectful, kind, and considerate. Your teachers will be there to assist, and you will make online friends and create virtual study groups. Online study may be new, but with dedication and persistence, you will achieve your goals. As an artist, I travel all over the world, and I find inspiration all around me. In the people, and especially the environment. I love the Bahamas with all its natural beauty. From Abaco in the north to Inagua in the south, and all the wonderful and colorful islands in between. But we must all do our part to keep the Bahamas healthy and clean, now and for the future generations. That's why I want you to find a little time to do your part. I'm doing my part because I care. Do you? ZNS is everywhere you are when you download the new ZNS app. Watch our live channel to keep up with what's going on in the nation. News updates, we've got you covered. Tune into our radio stations with just a swipe. On the road, on the go, we're here with you. Available for download on the App Store and the Google Play Store. Andres is the number one bone fishing destination on our planet. Sports fishermen visit our flats every year to participate in one of the most fulfilling outdoor activities known to man, fly fishing. And guess what? It's 100% sustainable. Without areas like the west side of Andres, sustaining this industry would be absolutely impossible. So let's take care of nature, and nature will take care of us. You can say business is buzzing for one honey producer on the island of Exuma. Bradley Charlton has been in the business for two years, but learning the craft for about six. He shared with us how he was able to expand his bee venture. Here's Jimanita Swain. We often procrastinate on it so long and we put stuff off and we make excuses. Just starting is a very pivotal point. Bradley Charlton is the proprietor of Bees and Trees based on the island of Exuma. Within the last two years, he has worked hard to grow his beekeeping business. He transitioned from working with chemicals to paying more attention to what he consumed. In trying to, you know, get a scholarship to BAMZ, where I would further my ambitions to somewhat feed myself, you know, some sort of semi-food independence, I stumbled across my mentor and we end up um, working out an apprenticeship program under the Eczema Foundation in Eczema. The program was Grow Eczema, and I became a certified permaculture designer and beekeeper. He's even seen growth in his bee colonies. You can see Charlton working with the hives to see exactly where the raw honey is sourced from. A hive is individual, and the apiary is like a bee yard, so to say, or like a bee farm. So it took me about one and a half, two years to begin my apiary. I started off with two hives and over three years, I have now 25 hives. So I come a long way. As to the type of honey he produces, the honey as of January is usually the lightest honey of the year. It is what we call a logwood honey because logwood flowers are the primary source for the honey to be made. And as the year transitions, the honey usually gets darker. Um, I call my lightest honey early bloom, my middle complexion honey, the traditional color of honey, brown gal, and mineral rich would be my darkest complexion of honey and sometimes it can be extremely dark like in this case. Charlton offers honey for sale in Exuma, Abaco and here in the capital as well. Anyone wishing to try out his bees and trees honey can do so by contacting him on any of his social media handles. Bahamian Olympic gold medalist Pauline Davis Thompson has moved to make her gold medal winning smoothies and lemonades available to the public. The Golden Leaf is her best selling smoothie. Thompson says a gentleman encouraged her to sell the products after he sampled her Olympic gold medal concoction and loved it. In addition to selling her Golden Delight smoothies at the Gladstone Road Farmers Market, Thompson recently got some good news about expanding her distribution at a major food chain.
finally got permission from Super Value. I am so excited for them to carry my smoothies. They're going to carry my smoothies in eight of their top stores. They're going to take it to two in Cable Beach, the one on Mackey Street, the three in Winton, the one in Golden Gates, and the one East Street South. So I am very, very excited. Right now, I'm only in three stores so far. I'm in the two in Cable Beach, and I'm in the one on Mackey Street. But my goal is to get to the other, the other stores. Stay close. We've got more right after this. You're watching The Morning Edition. It is important to take precautions to reduce your risk of getting infected with COVID-19, even when you go to the grocery store. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others while you wait in line to enter the store. One person per household needs to go. Use wipes to disinfect the cart or basket handle that you select. Avoid touching your face, unnecessary items, and surfaces. Try to touch only what you are buying. So carry a grocery list to help you move along quickly. Do not forget to wear a cloth mask while you do your shopping and carry hand sanitizer with you. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others as you shop. And at the cash register. as little time as possible in the store and get enough groceries to last you for a while. Once your groceries are packed and loaded, use hand sanitizer and rub your hands together until they are completely dry. When you come home from the grocery store, take off your shoes at the door and put all of your grocery bags in one area. Disinfect your grocery bags. Rinse produce and wipe down cans and packages with soap and water before you put them away. Wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds when you are done. Wash your clothes and your reusable grocery bags. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. As an artist, I travel all over the world and I find inspiration all around me and the people, and especially the environment. I love the Bahamas with all its natural beauty, from Abaco in the north to Inagua in the south, and all the wonderful and colorful islands in between. But we must all do our part to keep the Bahamas healthy and clean, now and for the future generations. That's why I want you to find a little time to do your part. I'm doing my part because I care. Do you? Now to your workout session this Monday with downtown Natasha Brown. Come on down, Natasha Brown has got you with the ultimate fitness. Hi, thank you for joining downtown today. Guess what? Don't allow anyone or anything to affect the outcome of your day or the quality of your life. I've got an awesome staircase routine for you. Wherever you are, if you got stairs, Let's get right into this routine. You're welcome to do anywhere between three to four sets and 15 to 25 reps, depending on the exercises and the level of your fitness. Let's get right to it.
next time. This is downtown Natasha Brown, getting you closer to becoming your ultimate you. navigate through this new way of learning. You should prepare for your online classes just as if you were attending a face-to-face -face class on your school's campus. So be on time. Wake up early and log on to the virtual platform at least five minutes before the start of your class. Set up a space that is dedicated to being used as a daily learning environment. This would help you to establish a routine. Your space can be at your dining room table, a library, or your church hall. It just needs to be a quiet place that is conducive to studying. Be prepared. Make sure your computer or tablet is fully charged and your camera is on. Use headphones, especially if you are in a shared space. Dress in appropriate clothing. Sit up straight. Remember, you will be in camera view. Mute your audio when your teacher is speaking. Be focused, be attentive, and actively participate. Before speaking, raise your hands, then type your questions in the chat box. Avoid distractions, and remember to always be respectful, kind, and considerate. Your teachers will be there to assist, and you will make online friends and create virtual study groups. Online study may be new, but with dedication and persistence, you will achieve your goals. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. For continuing to make ZNS your number one news and information network. Only the sun covers the Bahamas better than ZNS. And that's a wrap for us this morning for the entire team. I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great day, everyone. Barking at the two men who were gambling in the dark. It was staggering.